Hello and uh, welcome to the first module for the course. Uh, this module is titled Overview of the Natural Resource Sector in West Africa. And uh, like I said in the introductory video, this module generally introduces you to the sector in West Africa. We are going to be having some discussion about uh, natural resources in West Africa uh how natural resources affect growth and development in west africa uh natural resources versus the environment and climate change and uh, finally we are also going to have a look at the african mining vision and the uh, local content in some of these countries and at the end of this module you will be taking a continuous assessment uh which is uh, an assignment which uh, we expect every one of us to try and do and uh, we are going to be taking a quiz based on what we uh, learn from the course. So I'll go straight away into the course starting with what natural resources are. Uh, natural resources are just sources of materials and energy that are accessible to us in our environment in their primary form. So they are basically all those materials that we see around that we can transform into some sort of uh, material for a use or for some economic uh, purposes or for energy uh, to power uh, our stations, to power our homes and uh, other uh, locations. So natural resources can be broadly divided into two. There are some we call renewable resources, which are those that are available in infinite quantity. That is, they can be used repeatedly and they don't ever go dry. For instance, you talk about water, you talk about wind and uh, forests to some very good extent. Uh, they are renewable. Once you are cutting down a tree, you are able to plant another tree immediately. And there are some that are non-renewable. That is, they are limited in their... Um, existence due to the fact that um, they, they don't exist uh, forever. So for instance, uh, most solid minerals talk about uh, fossil fuel, um, gold, diamond, they exist in limited condition. The moment you've extracted them to uh, the, 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 the maximum, they cease to exist. So those are just uh, the broad classification of natural resources. So for this particular course, our focus will be majorly on the non-renewable natural resources. So in West Africa, uh, West Africa is one of the region of the world that is mostly blessed with uh, natural resources. Generally, Africa has about 30% of natural resources that exist globally, and a huge chunk of these natural resources exist in the West African region. For instance, in Nigeria, about 95% of foreign earnings are from uh, oil, uh, right from about four or five decades ago. Uh, in Cameroon, oil also accounts for about 50% of their total exports. Uh, in Senegal, about 51% of the total exports are from gold, phosphate, and some other material. While in Ghana, about 90% of the total mineral exports is from gold. Diamond and cocoa in Sierra Leone, gold and cotton in Mali. Uh, this is a map showing uh, the concentration of natural resources in West Africa. As you can see, it's uh, classified into agricultural resources, minerals, metals, metallic elements, and what of you. And every country in West Africa has one form of natural resource or the other that they can tap into, turn into some economic benefits for their development. But the reality in the in the West Africa sub-region is the fact that the abundance of these natural resources has not necessarily led to some meaningful development for some of these countries. Let's have a look at uh, this research that was done about 11 years ago, uh, which compared uh, natural resource exports and growth rates in West African countries. As you can see, the, the bar in ash color is uh, for uh, the growth rates, uh, is for resource exports rather in this country, and the lighter bar is uh, uh, the one that represents the growth rates in these countries. So one thing you notice from this uh, research is the fact that uh, some, 
most of these countries, apart from the Gambia, which has some uh, low uh, concentration of natural resources, apart from the Gambia, all countries in this uh, graph has a higher resource export percentage, much, much than the growth rates. Uh, if you take a closer look at uh, Côte d'Ivoire and Nigeria, you will see that the bar for the resource exports is very high. Meanwhile, growth rates in these countries are very, very low. That is the reality of uh, exports versus growth rates in West Africa. So it, the countries are classified into three. There are some that has higher natural resource exports and lower growth rates. You talk about Côte d'Ivoire, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Nigeria. The bars for natural resources exports are so high and you would expect that the growth rates in those countries should also be high, but that is not the case. There are some countries that are some, there are some very fair uh, relationship between the natural resource export and growth rate. Talk about Ghana, Niger Republic, Cape Verde, and uh, some others. And there are some that are some sort of moderates in a way, the Gambia, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Benin. So if you take a closer look at this graph, you realize that um, Despite the fact that there are resource abundance in most of these countries, the export earning doesn't necessarily interpret to economic growth rates. What may be responsible for this? Uh, before we answer this question, let's take a look at some recent data. So this is data on human and economic development in West Africa. So I picked about some uh, seven or uh, seven countries uh, to compare their economic growth rates uh, to the HDI and uh, poverty rate. Every year, countries in West Africa record economic growth rates. In 2021, Ghana recorded 5.4%, Sierra Leone 3.1%. The lowest in 2021 was the uh, Niger Republic, which only recorded 1.4%. But you realize that Despite the fact that the, the economic, the, the natural resources that exist in these countries are able to give them some sort of growth rates in a particular year, their human development index still remains very, very poor. Their poverty rate is still very, very high. So the human development index was uh, is just a ranking of countries uh, 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 for assessing country based on their economic, uh, not only the economic growth, but the human development uh, in that country. So for Ghana, it's 134, uh, which is, I think, the lowest on this chart. And for the Niger Republic, it is 189, one of the, the worst country in terms of human development index in uh, the whole world. But these countries are rich in natural resources. Ghana is rich in gold. Niger Republic has uh, 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 oil and every country on this chart has um, some sort of natural resources that gives them exports earning or the other. Why is their human development rank so high? Why is their poverty rate so high? So some of the factors accounting for slow growth rates in West African countries, we have something like corruption. So a lot of research has been done uh, on the extent or the, the effects of corruption on countries in West Africa, the fact that countries are exporting a lot of natural resources uh, uh, into some other countries. And at the same time, this natural resources doesn't necessarily interpret to development in the countries. So uh, also civil wars and uprisings in some of these countries also affect, for instance, the Nigeria Extractive Industries uh, Transparency Initiative, that's METI, estimated that Nigeria lost about 42 billion to crude oil thefts, as well as domestic and refined petroleum products between 2009 and 2018. Part of the reasons why this is possible is that there are, there are crises in this region where Nigeria extracts its oil. There is the crisis of uh, a, a, some particular group calling for secession in such area. And then uh, there is also the concept of Dutch disease, which was a concept that came into use uh, in the 1960s, which means um, a situation whereby a boom in an export sector 
leads to a shift in production uh, factors towards the booming sector. So uh, I use Nigeria as a case study, and uh, we are going to take a deeper look into this very soon. Also, on the bureaucracies that exist in some of these uh, countries, especially in the uh, agencies that undo their natural resource allocation in the country, also account for slow growth rates and uh, rent-seeking behavior. So all this factor put together reinforces the argument of uh, some people that say that uh, most uh, West African countries are, are resource cost. That is the fact that the, 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 the fact that they possess oil, natural gas, and other valuable minerals doesn't necessarily interpret economic growth and development in this country. So a typical example of this is Angola, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Sudan, and the Congo. These countries are very, very rich in natural resources, but you realize that because of these factors and some other factors um, by the side, they are not able to break the chain of poverty. And that is taking a very big toll on the citizens of this country. So it is important for us to inter for us to understand how this exists in our countries so that we'll be able to interrogate, to be able to identify the stakeholders that are responsible for what, and we'll be able to engage them and interrogate some of these issues so that we'll be able to get maximum uh, 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 output for uh, natural resources. So let's take a deep dive into some of these um, factors. Let's start with corruption. Uh, this is a table of the Corruption Perception Index of West African countries. Uh, this is the 2021 data, and uh, you realize that none of the African countries score up to 50 out of 100. So I tried to do a comparison to even see whether there is uh, uh, a, uh, a, an improvement from 10 years ago till last year, 2021. And you realize that uh, for Ghana, especially in 2011, they were they ranked 69 on the Corruption Perception Index. And in 2021, they just moved up, uh, they, they, they went down four places, having a worse ranking than 2011. For Syria alone, they moved up a bit from 134 to 115 in uh, 2021. That's a bit better. So it's a mix of uh, our ranking, some are better 10 years ago than now, some are worse 10 years ago than now. But the summary or the most important data here is the score over 100. None of these countries even score 45. That is way below average. And that is to tell you the level of corruption that exists in this country. Corruption in terms of who uh, uh, all these resources, uh, which company is uh, has the license to extract some of these resources, corruption about importing, corruption about subsidies, corruption about uh, 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 um, uh, safety, environmental safety, and all. So we are going to uh, take a deep dive into that uh, later in the course, but this table is just to show us that um, corruption is very, very rife in West Africa. And no matter how you want to look at it, it is greatly affecting the natural resource sector. Then the next one is uh, the concept of Dutch disease. And um, I think Nigeria presents itself as a very good example for this concept. Um, so during the colonial era, I mean, before independence, a lot of exploitation goes on in Nigeria. For instance, uh, before exploitation of oil, rather, agriculture served as the mainstay of Nigeria's economy. Nigeria, the, gov the colonial government and the early independent government depend largely on agriculture. Nigeria exports cocoa, Nigeria exports granules, Nigeria exports palm produce. And uh, up to the late uh, 50s, the agriculture sector in Nigeria employed over 70% of the labor force, and it accounted for over 60% of the foreign exchange earnings in Nigeria. So how did we go down from 70% or 60% of foreign exchange earnings to what it is today? Let's take a look at what it is today first. 
So this chart is the chart that uh, was designed around 2005, which tried to trace the share of agriculture in Nigeria's economy. And uh, let's take a look at the exports bar. So the exports bar at around 1960 was close to 80. That is close to 80% of the total uh, natural uh, national economy of Nigeria. And from that 80%, it sloped down to about say three to four percent in 2005. Currently, agriculture accounts for just about 2.67 percent. In that's the 2022 data in Nigeria. Just about just less than three percent, from over 70 percent in the 60s to just three percent in 2022. And the reason for that is because Nigeria discovered oil. And Nigeria decided to forget about agriculture. And now it is taking a toll on the economy. According to the estimation by the, uh, the uh, government agency that uh, extracts oil in Nigeria, the Nigeria's crude oil is going to dry up in about 30 to 50 years. What would the economy mistake be after the oil has dried up eventually? So that's a good example of um, the concept of Dutch disease. So um, it's very important for us to also look at the mining sector because the mining sector accounts for a larger percentage of natural resource extraction in West Africa. And um, one of the key uh, documents, policy documents uh, with regards to the mining sector is the Africa Mining Vision. So for some of these challenges that I've identified, some of these factors that I've identified already in 2009, uh, um, some countries come to, came together at the AU summit and uh, they adopted the African Mining Vision. So the African Mining Vision is a document uh, that tries to come up with a sustainable and well-governed mining sector. So it's uh, a document that tries to um, Prescri prescribe a, 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 a working mining sector for Africans by Africans and uh, governed by Africans, a situation whereby the natural resources that exist in Africa is being used for the development of Africans by Africans themselves. So it's part of uh, the, the proposition in the African mining vision is that to, for us to have a component of a diversified and vibrant and globally competitive industrialization of the natural resource sector, a mining sector that unnaced the potential of artisanal and small scale mining to stimulate local and national entrepreneurship. So a lot of uh, activities that goes on in the mining sector in Africa are majorly in the artisanal and small scale uh, sector. So the African mining vision came up to say, well, it's not bad that you have this sector? How can we unless uh, this potential? How can we formalize it to some extent uh, for us to be able to get the maximum benefit from it? That was the ideal, but what is the reality? Let's take a look at the reality. There, uh, a research in 2016 noted that artisanal mining provides livelihood for 8 million people across Africa. Yet it exists in a look in a legal gray area, often prey to organized crime and conflict. So from Nigeria to Senegal to Ghana, Mali, Niger Republic, or any other country in West Africa, artisanal mining exists in every sector without much legal uh, um, backup, without much uh, legal recourse for some of these people that engage in, in it. So what's what effort is the government of this country? bringing on board? What efforts are they putting, uh, taking to formalize the sector? Are there policies, are there policies favorable to these artisanal miners for, that will enable them to be willing to get themselves formalized? And uh, if there are some policies on grant already, who is monitoring this policy? This is a question that we need to ask in our different countries. What is the policy guiding mining? Uh, artisanal mining in Nigeria? What are the policies guiding artisanal mining in Ghana? What are the policies guiding artisanal mining in Senegal? 
which government agency is responsible for this? What are the laws? Is there some sort of um, licensing that has to come in? Is there some sort of affiliation to uh, 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 bigger companies for you to be recognized as an artisanal miner? If this is a law, who or which agency is responsible for making sure that this law is strictly abided by? So another uh, reality that we have to face with the African mining vision is to look into uh, uh, women in mining. So Africa has the highest proportion of women at Sana Miners. So about 40 to 50% of the workforce in the mining sector in Africa is composed of women. This is way different from the average of 30% that uh, we have globally. But you realize that these women are marginalized in the sense that they receive very poor pay. Sometimes they, don't, they, they are not treated very well. And uh, there is this systemic inability for them to rise to the management level. So most female artisanal miners that you find in West Africa either are out in the field crushing stones, are out in the field trying to save sign, or are out in the rivers trying to look for precious stones. Most of them are not able to make it to managerial level. What policies exist? How best do we mainstream the plight of these women? What are the current strategies? Are, are the current strategies working? And then lastly, uh, African mining sector is plagued with deforestation, land degradation, pollution, and disruption of the ecosystem. So are we on the path to realizing this vision? So very close to the African mining vision is also the, uh, uh, the concept of local content policy. So local content uh, majorly is the, is the value that an extraction project brings to the local, the regional, or the national economy beyond the resource revenues. That is beyond the money that Ghana gets from its gold. What other benefits does the existence of gold bring to Ghana. So you will be able to, as a country or as a people, you will be able to get maximum uh, benefits from a natural resource uh, that exists in that country. If there are some very good local content policies in such country. So the example of a of very good local content policies in courts is uh, that which exists in Cote d'Ivoire. So Cote d'Ivoire has some laws, which uh, includes the OHADA Companies Act of 1993, the Local Context Act, which was just passed in 2021, the Petroleum Code and the Labor Code. All these law laws put together uh, forms the local content policies of Cote d'Ivoire. And they have some specific uh, 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 provisions which uh, um, they have some specific provisions which tries to um, annex the potentials of all Ivorians. For instance, uh, under the Companies Act of 1993, uh, foreign companies operating in the country must register and become a local company after four years. So if you're a local company and you want to extract a natural resource, in a, a mineral resource in uh, Cote d'Ivoire today, you must make a plan to become a local company in the next four years, or else your license will not be renewed. So uh, another uh, very interesting part of their laws is that the local content law require oil and gas operators to give priority to hiring local Ivorians and patronizing local services. So it is stated in the law, the percentage of Ivorians that must exist in your country uh, in your company for you to be able to get your license or for you to be able to re uh, renew your license. And you must patronize local services, except such services doesn't exist. And also the country divided its hydrocarbon sector into three, category A, category B, and category C. And category C provide full access to multinationals for projects requiring technical expert only held by these stakeholders. So in each category, there's a percentage of Ivorians that you have to be involved, that has to be involved. There are some partnerships that you just must seek Ivorians. 
There's no way you can do such business without bringing in locals. And then uh, finally, the country's labor code requires that any job announcement to be formally declared to the Youth Employment Agency or the labor office of the country then advertised in a local newspaper. Only after which a foreign worker may be hired if no Ivorian equivalents can be found. So you have to put out this advertisement for Ivorians to, uh, uh, um, to apply for a job. It is only after a period of time that you can't find a suitable local that you can now look the way of a foreign national. That is the law. And that is the law that has been able to... Uh, uh, um, that has distinguished Cote d'Ivoire as one of the countries in West Africa with the best local content quality. Now, let's look at another country. Let's look at uh, Liberia. So in a research recently published, uh, it was noted that Liberia lacks a major local content policy. So there is no major, there is no local content act or local content bill or what have you in Liberia currently. So what serves as local content policy in Liberia is the Mining and Mineral Resource Law of 2000, that's about 22 years ago, and the 2010 Mineral, uh, mineral Policy. These two laws guide the mining sector generally in Liberia. So let us look at the reality uh, with these two laws. So the Mining and Minerals Law provides the mining companies cede 30% of their workforce to Liberians after five years and 70% after 10 years, but we can't ascertain the compliance because there's no record for it currently. So of course, some of these companies, maybe during the auditing stage, they could come up with any figure or whatever, but there's no record. There's nothing on the internet or anywhere that goes to show that in Liberia, this particular provision of the law is well complied with. That's one. Secondly, the law, the current laws do not give enough protection to local small and medium scale firms engaged in local production of mining gears. So for instance, the uh, local content law in, in, um, in Cote d'Ivoire makes it, uh, makes sure that, uh, provides that foreign multinationals must engage in local production of mining gear. They must engage local small and medium scale firm in the production of mining gears. But in, uh, in Liberia, there's no such law. Then thirdly, lack of skilled Liberians. You know, the uh, Liberia was involved in lengthy years of civil war and that also left a huge gap in local content implementation in the country. So unlike in other countries where there are specialized local content institution, the Ministry of Lands, Mines, and Energy oversees the mineral sector. In several countries in West Africa, uh, there are some specialized agencies that look after local content implementation in such countries. But this, there's no such agency in Liberia. What they have in Liberia is the Ministry of Lands, Mines, and Energy. And the ministry is so big that it's not even uh, staffed enough to look into the local content policy implementation as much as it should. And then if you look at it generally, you realize that uh, many of the local content policies requirements are not based on specific targets. For instance, the uh, minerals, uh, the 2010 uh, mineral policy states that um, Foreign multinationals, for instance, should engage in capacity and knowledge development. They should engage in technological uh, technology transfer. They should engage in local sourcing of goods and services, but there is no specific requirement. So capacity and knowledge development, how many percentage of your workforce should be engaged in this per year? There's no specification. Uh, technological transfer, local sourcing of goods and services, how many percentage of the goods and services should be sourced from local vendors. There is no statement about this in this law. So it makes it difficult to track. It makes it difficult uh, for implementation. And the current reality does not mirror what the African mining vision um, actually uh, foresees. So if you look at it generally, uh, 
it's not possible for us to look at the local government policies of each of these countries, but it is very, very important for us to interrogate this local content policy so that we can ask the right questions. When a multinational is not doing what he, uh, what it's supposed to do, you can look into the local content policies to say, this is the provision. This is what you are supposed to be doing. This is the penalty for not doing it. And you are able to uh, 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 um, set agenda for them. So let's look at some of the areas that uh, we should beam some such lights on in our countries. First and foremost, um, you need to understand what the content of your country's local co uh, content policy is. And you need to also find a way to simplify it in a way that local actors are able to know what the content is. For instance, if a company is cited in a particular community, the community should know what percentage of such companies uh, employment should go to the locals. So you, you need to understand that and you need to simplify it in such a way that people understand as well. Also, we need to question the monitoring of this. How are countries, how is my country monitoring the implementation of this local content policy? How well do they perform their duty? Is there any form of collusion between multinational companies and these institutions? Are politicians awarding rent to regime supporters? Sometimes politicians don't care about what the local government, uh, local content policy is. They, what they care about is what political gain they can get from some of these uh, actors. Are there some sort of pollution? Are there some sort of corruption in that regard? Do local capitalists have enough capacity or willingness to match local content policy benefits? So you need to also understand that it's not enough for a country to have a local content policy. You also have to have some level of capacity, some minimum level of capacity to tap into it or a journey into a minimum level of capacity. So we need to interrogate that. And uh, finally, you need to also ask the question of uh, does your country's Local content policy have special consideration for already marginalized people. For instance, women. So uh, we've succeeded in looking at uh, uh, natural resource generally, looking at what it means, the uh, broad types of natural resources. And um, also we've succeeded in uh, interrogating natural resources versus economic growth and development. Uh, we've looked at the factors responsible for slow growth rates in West African countries, and um, we looked at the African mine invasion and also the local content policies of um, uh, countries, slow model countries in West Africa. So uh, briefly, we are going to look into natural resources versus the environment and climate change. So this is uh, a quote by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan on uh, environmental degradation and uh, natural resources. It's a very good quote. So, environmental degradation in forms such as the certification, resource depletion, and demographic pressure exacerbates tensions and instability. Systematically, pollution, population growth, and climate change are not in the distant future. They are occurring now and eating the poorest and most vulnerable artists. I think this quote summarizes our reality in terms of the effects of natural resource exploitation in West African countries and the reality, the impact of it on our environment. So it's important for us to have some conversation about the environment. So exploitation of natural resources is an essential condition for human existence. It is important for all as human to go into nature, exploit what nature uh, uh, has given to us freely and transform them into some sort of benefits for us. But you realize that exploitation of these resources sometimes have some unintended consequences. So the impact of resource exploitation on the environment includes over-exploitation of resources, destruction of ecosystem, pollution, or what have you. And you realize that a lot of time, these negative consequences arises from harmful exploitation, such as 
illegal amphibian mining, oil bunkering, deforestation, gas flaring, illegal fishing, among others. Uh, there are some negative effects of this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, neg uh, of this destruction of the ecosystem. So in uh, 2010, over 300 people, including several children, died of lead poisoning in Zamfara. And that was as a result of illegal gold mining, which contaminated the source of water for the villagers. Also in Ghana, between 2011 and 2012, over 300 illegal mining related deaths were reported in Ghana just in the space of one year. In Bamako, 16 people were killed following collapse of a shaft in the gold mine. All of them were artisanal miners. And in Chad, about 100 people were killed in clashes that broke out between artisanal gold miners overnight. Just in one night, over 100 people died. So these are some of the negative effects of natural resource exploitation. And we have this negative effect because sometimes there are no policies and laws guiding this sector. And sometimes there are no implementation of this, of these laws. So it has some very negative uh, uh, consequences on the people and the environment. Now let's look at uh, natural resources. So natural resources are embedded in environments and uh, in most of these environments, the actions of one individual affects the, the, uh, the affects the other person. For instance, the action of artisanal miners in Zamfara affected the source of water for the villagers and the fact that these villagers didn't know that they are consuming contaminated water. A lot of them died, about 300, uh, three of them died. And you realize that um, in the past few years, changes in the ecology of an environment oftentimes may not be readily apparent. For instance, if a river is shrinking, you might not be able to know that this river is shrinking until after some years, you now realize that, oh, this is not how I saw this river some 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, for instance, why reserve scarcity in terms of water and arable land remains a major factor of fueling the insecurity in states along the chart. Ethnicity, religion, and politics are mostly canvassed as manifest function, uh, factors. So the five countries along uh, the chart, uh, currently they are facing some uh, security crisis. In Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, Chad, there is terrorism and uh, there are pharma other crises. So a lot of time when policy makers, when stakeholders want to explain this crisis, they explain them in terms of ethnicity, they explain them in terms of religion, they explain them in terms of politics, Meanwhile, it is not totally due to those. It is also due to some changes that exist in the natural environment. So farmers' adverse crisis is one of the major security challenge in West Africa. Why policymakers try to seek political solution, little attention is paid to the latent factor of climate change. Now, let's look at the reality. Covering four countries, about 30 million people and millions of cattle depend on Lake Chad as water source. However, the lake has shrunk by 90% of its size since the 1960s. So there is currently an over-exploitation of Lake Chad. Farmers along the, the, the Chad depend on the water to grow their crops every year. Cattle rearers also depend on the water to feed their uh, cattle. The residents of this area also depend on the water for their domestic use. So there is some sort of over-exploitation of this already. So, and also some other rivers that you find in West Africa, so that's River Niger, River Benue, they have shrunk by not, they, they, are, they are not currently in their former size, their size say 20, 30 years ago. And this is fueling conflict in the region. For instance, the farmers' adverse crisis in Nigeria has led to the death of 19,000 people. In fact, it's far over 19,000 buried already because this is a, a 2019 data. Failing to acknowledge the impact of climate change and over exploitation, which exacerbates uh, resource scramble, 
Nigerian president actually have this to say about the crisis. In 2016, he blamed the crisis on education. In 2018, he blamed the crisis on security. Uh, and in 2021, he blamed it on the absence of cattle uh, routes and also politics being played by politicians. But these are not the reasons why uh, the crisis continues to, to fail off. One of the reasons is because there is overexploitation of the resources that we have around. So it's important for us to interrogate uh, some of these things so that we'll be able to uh, ask the right questions so that we'll be able to uh, uh, channel our accountability towards the right way. So some of the areas that uh, we should investigate uh, is the influx of Chinese into the region. Almost in every West African countries where the Atlantic Ocean borders, there are Chinese illegal miners around. It is very important for us to investigate their activities. A lot of them, for instance, uh, in the Gambia and also in Nigeria, they engage in illegal fishing. So it's important for us to interrogate this. Also, um, uh, fishing practices, deforestation and forest encroachment, especially for some very rare um, um, uh, 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 natural resource materials such as rosewood in Ghana. So the extent and consequences of forest depletion in West Africa, um, West Africa has a lot of forests, uh, but the reality is a lot of these forests have been encroached such that some natural habitats are already destroyed. Some animals are going into extinction. Just a few months ago, uh, in one of these uh, countries, uh, I can't remember now, an elephant was killed and the villagers started celebrating. That is not the way to go. Then uh, it's important for uh, Ghanaians to look into rosewood trafficking in Ghana. Is the ban effective? Then uh, generally, we need to look into mining contracts. I think we'll speak more about that in the next two modules. And then government investment in renewable energy infrastructure, natural resources revenues in countries, energy transition, and uh, it's important for us to look into women in mining. It's, it's very, I can't overemphasize this. It's very important for us to always write about the plight of women in mining. So uh, before we end the session, it's uh, important for us to uh, have a reflection on some of the things I've spoken about already. And um, we have these uh, assignments uh, which would guide us in that. So. The first thing uh, I'll task us to do is to do a research and identify three major issues, three major controversies around natural resource in our country. So it could be about resource allocation. It could be about the impact on the environment. It could be about the activities of multinational companies, just anything on the natural resource sector. So identify these uh, issues and generate three story ideas you would like to work on. Three story ideas you would like to work on. And then in the next module, I'm going to introduce us to how we can use the skill of investigative journalism to look into these issues that we identify and uh, eventually we should be able to come up with a story. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Uh, the second module is on investigative journalism in the natural resource sector. And uh, it's, I think it's gonna be a very exciting uh, module which teaches how you as a journalist can use uh, the instrumentality of uh, investigative journalism to demand accountability in the natural resource sector.